I live my life, plan and do, worry and wonder. But whenever I step back, ponder what it's all about, I go to the laws of nature. But down deep, what are the laws of nature? What makes them laws? Are the laws of nature necessary like the laws of logic? The universe and humanity, our origins and purposes depend on these laws. But where do the laws of nature come from? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. I begin at the University of Cambridge. Whenever I have a deep question of science, one person I turn to is England's Astronomer Royal, the master of Trinity College, Sir Martin Rees. Martin, in thinking about existence, everybody starts with talking about the laws of nature, laws of physics, and fine, I know what that is, but, you know, frankly, if I stop to think about it, I'm, I'm really not sure what we really mean by laws. You're not the first to be puzzled. One of Einstein's most hackneyed sayings is, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And what he meant by that is that the uh, laws of nature which our minds are attuned to understand seem to apply not just here on Earth, but elsewhere in the universe. We could imagine a universe where there were no laws at all, completely anarchic, mm. where every atom was different, uh, where the laws of nature were different in different places, etc. And were that the case, clearly we'd make no progress at all in making sense of the external world. So it's in a contingency, so far as we understand, that the universe and our world does display all these regularities. And that's what makes science possible. We start off by classifying things, by um, biologists classifying species, chemists classifying different substances and physicists classifying atoms and particles. And then we find that all these particles are the same everywhere and they are governed by quite simple laws that we can write down and express mathematically. Of course, the progress of science has been these successive unifications and understanding that uh, there are patterns in nature. And this, of course, makes science possible. It makes it possible to make some predictions and to understand things. And also, it means we don't need to remember so much. We needn't record the fall of every apple because we know how it happens. And so it is the lawfulness, as it were, of the natural world which makes science possible. And it is a mystery, I suppose, why this is the case. But if we ask what are scientific laws, then, of course, they're of different kinds. But the most straightforward, in a sense, fundamental are those of physics, those which tell us the properties of the fundamental particles like protons and electrons and tell us about the forces that govern them. Do you see laws being like hierarchical, if that's the most fundamental? Mm -hmm. Are there laws operating at different levels of uh, emergent of physical properties? I think there are, because uh, um, if we think of the sciences, one sometimes thinks of them in a sort of hierarchy with um, physics at the bottom, then chemistry, then cell biology, and then all the way up to social science, right, right. and then uh, economists up in the penthouse, as it were. <laughs> um, and uh, one thinks of this as a hierarchy, like the different levels in a building. That analogy is false in a certain way, because in a building, insecure foundations imperil what goes above yes. that. Whereas in the case of different uh, levels of hierarchy, then they're independent. I mean, uh, a biologist trying to explain animal behavior doesn't really analyze it in terms of physics, and he has different laws, and ditto the cell biologist, etc. So each level in science has its own autonomous concepts. Laws are regularities that work everywhere the same. That seems obvious, but when I think about it, it's astonishing. If there were no laws, we could understand 
nothing. But we understand a great deal. In the hierarchy of laws, the most fundamental, the bottom layer, is physics. And to talk physics, I visit Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg, a founder of the so-called Standard Model, which explains fundamental particles and forces. Steve, when you think about the laws of nature, laws of physics, how do you characterize them or categorize them? Well, that's a great discovery that nature is uh, governed by laws. I mean, this is something that wasn't apparent for a long time. In fact, uh, the idea of laws of nature was, was rejected by a, a Muslim philosopher, Al-Ghazali, in the 13th century on the ground that the very concept put God in chains, uh, you know, and that things happen not because there are laws of nature, but because God wants them to happen that way. Of course, that attitude makes science difficult. We have all kinds of laws, and the engineering student learns various laws of Ohm's law, and uh, which tells you how current and resistance and voltage are related in an electric circuit, and so on. Many of these laws are uh, derive from deeper laws. In fact, uh, uh, that's true of most of the laws we learn as, as students. Some of them are, are purely empirical. We don't know why they work, uh, but most of the ones that have been well tested have then been understood on the basis of, of deeper laws. We keep peeling away deeper laws and deeper laws. The deepest laws that we have at present, the laws that from which all other laws can be deduced insofar as they can be deduced from anything are the laws of the standard model, a set of equations governing quantum fields which manifest themselves as various particles, electrons and quarks and photons. And the next big step is to say why is the standard model the way it is? That's not a final law. What is underneath that? We don't know. Einstein had another phrase that said that one of his questions was, did God, however he used the term, have a choice in creating the universe as he did? Einstein explained that when he used the word God, he meant uh, the principle of order and, and harmony in nature. He didn't mean a personal God who concerned himself with human beings. So if you take what Einstein said and replace the word God by whatever fundamental principle governs the universe, uh, then you could understand what he's saying. He's saying, is there any uh, freedom in the laws of nature that govern the universe? Are, is only one set of laws of nature possible or are there other possibilities? The only way in which Einstein, it seems to me, might have made some sense in, in asking that question is, are there any other possible rich universes? Is there any choice of a universe complicated enough to include us? Or to look vaguely like our universe? The search for deeper laws, more fundamental laws, is the driving force of physics. Steve's quest? A final theory. But even then, even with a final theory, questions will remain. Is ours the only universe which can include human beings? Now, from fundamental physics to the world we know, how do the laws of nature work? I go to the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton to meet one of the world's most innovative scientists, Freeman Dyson. I ask Freeman how he describes the laws of physics. The laws of physics are mostly equations, things like Maxwell's equations describing electric, electric and magnetic fields, Einstein's equations describing gravity. So they're these very simple and beautiful equations, which are in some sense totally precise and really describe what nature does. Somehow nature knew that <laughs> and does what the equations say. 
And that's something quite unique. There's nothing like that in biology. There's nothing like that in chemistry or anywhere else. In, in the rest of science, you have what we call emergent laws, which are laws which arise out of complicated structures where the details don't matter, but the, the, the structure as a whole has a well-recognizable behavior, like, so for example, the laws of evolution in biology, which uh, you can't write down an equation for evolution, but you know what it means. <laughs> it, it, it tells you roughly how things go when you have a, a, a whole lot of species competing with each other. <laughs> So those are def definitely laws, but they are not in the same category. They are some sort of uh, abstraction arising out of a whole multitude of facts. It's so simple, these equations. I mean, mathematics can be hard, but, but they're, they're simple in terms of they're, they're small. Right. Yeah, they take only two lines to write down. I mean, that is the miracle. This is sort of recent in a way. I mean, in the whole history of science, well, Newton was the first. That came as the sort of the, the overwhelming discovery in the 17th century that you can describe the heavens, at least, and, and the planets and uh, the motions of the moon and, and the fall of an apple with one equation, namely Newton's equation. Now, there's another group, generally philosophers, that say, sure, these equations work, but they really don't represent reality. It is just a human intervention imposing on reality some of our constructs that we're never going to get to the real reality. Well, that, of course, that may be true. I mean, we only just came down from the trees and, and we were just monkeys who are playing around with things. And it's amazing how well we are doing. But still, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it turns out that everything we're doing is sort of a, 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 a very, very partial and, and there's a whole world of existence out there of which we're, we haven't an inkling. And so I wouldn't be at all surprised if our th science in a thousand years looks extremely primitive. I don't regard what we have now as final. Physicists would say that laws are the reality, the most fundamental thing, and therefore we can do away with some kind of an artificial god, whereas philosophers of religion may say that these laws are uh, indicative of the, of the mind of God. And so people then imbue in these laws some deeper significance. Yes, well, of course, I'm not a philosopher. I mean, if you wanted to say what I am, I would say I'm a dualist in a way. That I think there is a physical world and there is a mental world, and they're very different. And we understand the physical world extremely well. We understand the mental world hardly at all. And of course, all these questions about God and about the nature of consciousness and so on, these belong to the mental world. And I don't think we're close to understanding them. Einstein sort of uh, uh, was the prototype of a scientist who sort of worshipped nature as, as his god and he thought of the laws of physics as sort of being in some sense the god that he worshipped and, and the, the majesty of the universe he saw in the laws of physics. Mm. I, don't quite, I don't go along with that. I mean, I think the, the laws of physics are fine as far as they go. There's no reason to imagine that that's all there is. Mm. And we have certainly a lot of evidence that there are mental things which are outside the, the, the scope of physics, but we don't have the tools really to grasp them. I prefer that the laws are independent, that the mental world has its own autonomy, but then, of course, that's my prejudice. <laughs> God may turn out to disagree with me, as he often has in the past. <laughs> to Freeman, Science is nowhere near a final theory. And in the future, he says, what we know today will look primitive. He rejects the claim that the laws of physics are all there is, and asserts that there is a kind of mental world very different from the physical world. I'm still at sea. Are the laws of nature special entities somehow out there? To explore this, I go to Oxford to meet Peter Atkins, a tough-minded physical chemist who brooks no mystical, metaphysical, or mental meaning in laws. You have to be careful what, about what you mean by a scientific law. My view is that a scientific law is just a summary of observation. So it's a summary of behavior.
that you, you make a lot of observations on, for example, an electron and you find a consistency of behaviour and you encapsulate that consistency in a statement which, is, which you call a law. Um, so so it, 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 in one sense it sounds the same, but in another sense there's a subtle difference, which is a fundamental difference, in that the law is not something existing in its own right and then it being expressed absolutely. in different ways. Absolutely. And what you then do, you construct theories um, accounting for those laws. And I think the, um, it begins with experiment, with observation, observation and control conditions that enables you to formulate this summary of behaviour, the law. And then you develop a theory, or you, you make a guess yeah. about what the reason might be. You call that a hypothesis. And then if, you, if your hypothesis rings true, then you construct a, a theory, which is often a mathematically rigid theory. So the law is a summary of observation, and um, it's quite conceivable that the, uh, the observations change with time. I mean, that gives science such, such an excitement. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's, uh, so science is a monument to the human intellect. To Peter, laws are simply summaries of observations, little more. Such thinking empowers data, elevates experimentation, and dethrones laws from its lofty perch. But what about the laws of physics? Aren't they necessary? In San Francisco, I meet Lee Smolin, a physicist at the Perimeter Institute near Toronto who's unafraid to ruffle some physics feathers. I ask Lee, from where did the laws of physics come? I think there's two very different kind of ideas about this in the history of philosophy and that face us now. One of them is that the ultimate truth about reality is timeless. So they don't come from anywhere, the ultimate laws, they just are. The tradition of looking for explanation of the laws in terms of necessary relations is closely connected with the idea that the laws are mathematical because there's the belief that mathematics is the study of necessary relationships. Right, right. And the idea that what we're doing is looking for an ultimate mathematical model of the world is part of this, and that's one direction that the search for this question goes. Yeah. Having said this, I don't believe this at all. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's and what I want to find the, out. And the other direction goes into the direction that what's most fundamental is what's bound in time, that time is fundamental, time always exists, and time is change. And if you go in this direction, then where do the laws of nature come from? They come from the past. They're the results of processes that happened in the past. There are problems in gravity and quantum gravity and cosmology that I believe push us in this direction. It pushes us in the direction in which the explanation for why the laws are the way they are is because they evolve from the past. Whether there's a meta law or not, the laws that we observe were not true before the Big Bang. They were different and they were different again before the Big Bang of the previous universe and so forth. And so what you're looking at is some kind of an evolution of law. Yes. Of the laws of physics. Yes. Why, why would you have a narrowing of physical laws through different universes, however it happens? If it's just gener generated randomly, why doesn't it just explode in a random direction? It might, in which case one would not expect to find any coherence, any structure amongst the laws, any okay. complexity in the universe. So that you're was reasoning created. teleologically. You're reasoning from an end result. Well, not and teleologically, but I'm reasoning from the observation that we live in a universe that's very special, that's full of complexity, okay. and that that so requires that as a fact of the matter. Yes, and that that requires explanation, okay. yeah. and so that suggests that suggests reproduction of universes, reproduction of space and time. Maybe space itself is the result of a process of evolution that could have led to some very complex, chaotic unspace, some just network of stuff. Right. 
And the fact that it results in space is a consequence of the evolution. Maybe a universe that gets very big is able to propagate itself more successfully. So the opposite of it being necessary is it's all contingent. And that, and Darwinian natural selection is the methodology that shows us how much we can get from almost pure contingency. Laws evolving so that their universes can grow larger and propagate better? A bit much, Lee. Although speculations are almost always wrong, they challenge current belief and impel us over the horizon. But still I ask, in their deep essence, at their core, what are these laws of nature? I need a contrarian. So I travel to Princeton to meet a renowned philosopher of science, Bas von Frossen. You have said you don't believe in law, that there's an insuperable dilemma about <laughs> physical law. Yes. I want to understand why. Well, in the 17th century, the concept of law was very important, both in philosophy and in science. They sink into the culture. Mm -hmm. They become pop philosophy, you might say. At the same time, in the 17th century, the concept of law was being taken away from theology. It was no longer the commands of God. Maybe they were still for Newton, but <laughs> they were disappearing from that scene. Some sort of secular equivalent was being kept because certain principles looked so basic that they were called laws. And the concept of law was still connected very closely with the idea of natural necessity, mm -hmm. necessity in nature. Could not be otherwise. Could not be otherwise, exactly, which came from the Aristotelian tradition. But if you look at how scientists reason today, they're not asking what is necessity, what is necessary in nature. They're not talking in terms of laws. Sometimes they use the word law, but they'll use the word law as an honorary epithet. Now, if you look at how scientists reason, they reason in terms of models and their symmetries, or symmetry breaking, about very basic structures. They're not talking about what is necessity in nature. It's only the metaphysicians who are doing that now. You're saying the problem with law is it has this, uh, this baggage of necessity. Yes. Which, which should be cut off. Yes. The notion of law implies necessity. As you say, it's supposed to explain why things have to happen the way they do. The empiricist says things just happen. There's nothing that explains why they have to happen the way they do. You've talked about that a model or a theory it can't go to necessity because it can't be tested, in a sense, against that which hasn't happened right. or a theory right. against no one who has proposed something different. Right. So there's, there's always the possibility of something new that you can't absolutely eliminate. Right. If you wanted to test necessity, you'd have to see what would happen in another world, another possible world. All possible worlds. Or all possible worlds, <laughs> exactly. And how do you do that? Yeah. You, know, you can make predictions and test them in this world. That's as far as you can go. So, so it's a different way of thinking. You don't need necessity, therefore you don't have law. Right. But you use the tools of model making, development yes. of theories, yes. and using symmetry as a powerful test or probe or mechanism to enrich your, th your theories and your models. Yes. It's a different way of thinking, and it's the way of thinking that is current in contemporary physics. Very different from the way of thinking that was current in the 17th century, which was law thinking. Unfortunately, in my mind, in philosophy, there's a lot of law thinking left. What's real? What's fundamental? To speak of the laws of nature may betray archaic thinking. There are regularities in nature, things that are or work the same, always, everywhere, across our universe, just like across our kitchen. But because they are not necessary, it is not impossible for these regularities to have been otherwise. They cannot be laws. And they might change, subtly in our universe or massively in different universes. Regularities are real 
known by observation and testing. But what we call laws may be human constructions, our peculiar sense of order imposed on an indifferent reality. But why the regularities? Why is it so that all is always and everywhere the same? Is something here hidden that's closer to truth? For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. <laughs>